I have been asked to welcome um, you all here today and also to briefly introduce our, our respected speaker, Dr. Michael Bertolacci. Um, and so we're going to hear from Dr. Bertolacci today in his talk titled A Shifting Carbon Cycle, Hunting for Changes in Ecosystems Emissions and Absorption of CO2. And so this, of course, is such an important um, research field and it's a fitting seminar to end our Global Climate Change Week activities here at UOW. Um, a little bit about um, Dr. Bertolacci. Um, he has a PhD from the University of Western Australia where he used applied statistical methods um, to study Australian rainfall. And I even commented that I guess he might even get some questions from all of us about that after this too. Um, and so we're really lucky to have Dr. Bertolacci with us at the University of Wollongong in Nyasra, where he's a research fellow, working with Professors Noel Prezi and um, Andrew Zamet Mandron, and continuing in his important research in the field of statistics and its application to solving real world environmental problems of which he's going to speak to us um, now about. And so please, let's make um, Dr. Bertolacci welcome. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you um, very much for the kind introduction, Kat, and also Noel. Um, and lovely to hear my surname pronounced. It's just rich, perfect um, pronunciation. It doesn't happen every time. Um, yes, yeah, so, so thank you, um, um, everyone, for coming today, and, and I'll thank everyone, uh, the organisers, um, who, for inviting me. It's really um, a privilege to speak today. Um, so my name's Michael. I'm, I'm a postdoc, as you've just heard. Um, I, I do mathematics and statistics here at the University of Wollongong. Uh, and I, I'm going to talk about our work on um, hunting for changes in, in the carbon cycle, uh, and in particular in um, the aspect of the carbon cycle that's about emission and absorption of, of CO2. Um, now, I'll, I'll put a caveat at the start that I, I prepared this talk for a moderately general audience, um, but the work is at the intersection of, of statistics and, and climate, um, climate science or atmospheric science. Um, and, and what that means is that this talk will probably be unsatisfactory for both statisticians and atmospheric science. Um, but I hope in, in different ways. Um, so I'll move on. Um, and, and this work in, involves quite a lot of people from, from different disciplines. Uh, th there are three statisticians uh, on this team. Uh, these are their names, by the way. Um, we've got four atmospheric uh, scientists uh, and, and an IT specialist. Um, and, and really, we, we need everyone. Um, so, uh, so, that, so, so, you know, it goes to show you how some problems really need an interdisciplinary team. Um, and, and we've had so much help from other people in, in, in different communities, um, some of whom I, I thank you. Um, okay, okay, so that we can dive in. And I thought, you know, given the occasion of um, Global Climate Change Week, it, it would be good to start from a quote with a quote from the, um, the IPCC, uh, the UN um, panel that, that discusses um, climate change and the science behind it and, and solutions to it and so on. Um, <clears throat> of course, if you've come to a, an event for Global Climate Change Week, you probably don't need convincing that, that climate change is important, um, but here we go. So I'll, I'll just read this quote. Um, Human influence on, on the climate system is, is clear and recent anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases are the highest in history. Continued emission of greenhouse gases will cause further warming and long lasting changes in all components of the climate system. So I highlighted in red the, the second part of this um, because it links to the graph on the right. Uh, and, and this graph on the right is a plot of the um, ongoing rec record of carbon dioxide concentration uh, in parts per million, uh, taken at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. Um, this is called the, the Keeling Curve, um, a curve because it, it's curving up, um, and Keeling after the um, Ralph Keeling, who, who pioneered this work, a very famous scientist. Um, and, and it shows how, how CO2, the, the main greenhouse gas, uh, continues to go up and, and up. Um, and, and this, of course, is the curve we, we need to control um, uh, in order to avoid what the IPCC is, is warning about. Um, so, so, of course, the, the rise in concentration in CO2 is due to human emissions. Um, but what not everyone knows is that actually around half of what we emit gets reabsorbed by the, uh, the land ecosystems and, and also by the ocean, um, which is, of course, very good news for us because otherwise the concentration of CO2 would have risen by twice as much um, since pre-industrial times. Um, so, so there... It's an interesting uh, question as to why this is happening. For, for the land, there are quite a few hypotheses, but the main one is, um, is, that, um, is that there's this concept of CO2 fertilisation. So, so when there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, it makes photosynthesis easier for plants and then they grow more. 
Um, and so in some ways, plants respond directly to atmospheric CO2. Um, and for the ocean, um, there's also an effect that causes more CO2 to dissolve in. And that's because, uh, as again, as CO2 concentrations rise, uh, the, what's called the partial pressure of CO2 over the surface of the ocean increases, and more CO2 dissolves into the ocean as a result. Um, so, so really, for both, of the land, both the land and the ocean, there are clearly changes to, to carbon cycles that are going on. This is just one baseline change. Of course, this absorption wasn't happening before we started emitting um, CO2. Things were in balance before then. Um, and, and if you look at land, um, land ecosystems, uh, in addition to this change where uptake is increasing, um, there are other changes that have been documented as well. Um, so here are a few important papers, by no means a comprehensive survey um, on this topic. Um, so in the first, um, growing seasons are, are, are were found to be growing longer, um, to get, getting longer due to warming temperatures. And why are growing seasons relevant? Well, growing seasons are the time when plants are taking carbon in from the atmosphere and storing it in, in their biomass. So that's really a change that's, that seems to be happening. Um, in, in the second paper, the middle one, um, they, they documented earlier starts to growing seasons, um, also probably linked to temperature, but there are some questions about that one. Uh, so that's another change. That changes the timing of when ecosystems are absorbing CO2. Um, and the last one is, is that land usage changes. So this is distinct from temperature. Land usage changes um, are causing changes all over, all over the globe, and, and this paper focused on tropical and boreal um, forests. Uh, so lots of changes going on. Uh, and, and this is not a representative sample of papers, but um, uh, what we can say is that all, all of these changes are, are really important. Um, and, and of course, that's because these ecosystems have intrinsic value, so we want to understand them and, and protect them. Uh, but they're also important because ecosystems are, uh, you know, ameliorating our impact on the climate by pulling down CO2. So we really want to understand what's going on with these ecosystems. And if you put that together, in short, uh, there's really a pressing need to um, quantify and understand changes to the carbon cycle. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, is talk about our work on this. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is hunt for when and where these changes are occurring, uh, what ecosystems, um, how, much, how strong are they, and so on. Um, so that's some motivation. Uh, um, changes to the carbon cycle are really important. Uh, and, and I thought before I talk about what we did, I should talk a little bit about the carbon cycle itself. So we're on the same page. Um, this is where I really put a caveat. I'm a statistician who's, I spent a couple of years learning this stuff, um, but I'm not, I'm not uh, um, a scientist in this field um, uh, by, uh, directly by any measure. So um, I'll just plow on and, and let, you, let, you, let you sit with that. Um, so, so here's a diagram that I took from uh, a website by NOAA, the, the agency in the US that, among many other duties, does, uh, monitors the atmosphere. Um, and, and it's a bit busy. There's a lot going on in this picture, which is actually probably appropriate because the carbon cycle is pretty complicated. Um, but the key thing to note is that there are various pools of carbon and, and pathways or exchanges of carbon going on here. Um, so the atmosphere is a pool of carbon. Obviously, there's carbon stored up there. Um, another pool is, is the biosphere. So, you know, plants, trees, animals, us are mostly made of carbon, not water, but carbon is clearly very important. Um, and the carbon uh, gets locked up and that forms a pool of carbon. Um, and of course, um, the ocean is also a pool of carbon. Things dissolve, uh, as I talked about before, CO2 dissolves and moves around in the ocean. And, and exchanges between the pools and within the pools also happen in, in various places. So, so plants grow and when they grow, they absorb carbon from the atmosphere and it stores more in the pool. Um, later, the plants might dry, um, die rather, or, or drop their leaves in, 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 in autumn. Um, and those leaves, um, sit on the ground and then when it warms up, it, it, they decay and the carbon gets released. Um, so that, that's, you know, there's one direction there going into the, into the, um, the pool and then another direction going out. Um, carbon dissolves into the ocean and then it can move around internally within the ocean, it's released again. Um, and, and fires, there are fires, so you can have bushfires, that's, that's a pretty rapid way to release carbon from an ecosystem that just burns and goes into the atmosphere. Um, and, and of course, um, there's also fossil fuels. So humans, are, of course, are pumping tons and tons, well, not just tons, gigatons, in fact, of, of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. Um, and, and that's another exchange of uh, CO2. Um, now, in this work, we, we, we focus on exchanges between the atmosphere and the land. So there are lots of other exchanges. There's like rivers running into the ocean, carry carbon into the ocean, but we didn't focus on that in this work. We're talking about exchanges between the atmosphere and the land. Um, and also how CO2 moves around in the atmosphere. 
Uh, so I really simplified the previous diagram to just show the essential elements here. Um, um, so the main interactions. So, so the atmosphere is at the top, um, and it's got some arrows going to and from the atmosphere indicating the direction of exchange. Um, so from left to right, um, there, there are fires. Of course, that emits carbon, doesn't cause any to be absorbed directly. Um, there's photosynthesis, which is really plants growing and uh, assimilating carbon, uh, and that's stored there. There's um, plant respiration, that, that's that decay process. Um, it also happens directly from plants, that's how it goes back up. Um, there's um, the ocean, which can be both a source and a sink, so it's got arrows in both directions. Uh, and fossil fuels is always a source, unfortunately. Um, and I've drawn some arrows, like I said, in the atmosphere itself to indicate that once CO2 hits the atmosphere, it doesn't stay put, it moves around, and that's going to be pretty important to our story very soon. Um, so now I'm going to save time and start using the word flux instead of saying source and sink over and over again. Um, so a flux describes an exchange of CO2 between the surface and the atmosphere. Um, a positive flux in, in our, um, in our um, definition is, is when um, it's an emission, so that's when CO2 goes from the land to the atmosphere, and a negative flux is, is absor absorption. So you could also say positive is a source and negative is a sink. So you, can, you could do the opposite way, that's what we did. Um, and once you add up all the sources and sinks, you, you get this thing called the, um, the flux field at the surface. Uh, we, we call it X. Um, um, and it varies over space and over time. Uh, so this image shows uh, a, an estimate of the flux field over the globe, averaged over six years. So there's no time in this picture because we've kind of averaged that out over six years. Um, and, and you can see here, so you can see some things. So brown is, brown is the source. And you can see that the Northern Hemisphere by and large pops up as a source. And this is largely due to fossil fuel emissions in these, um, most people live in the Northern Hemisphere, so that's where most of the fossil fuels get burnt. <clears throat> um, um, some regions are sinks too. Um, the ocean is a bit washed out, that's because its exchanges are less intense at any one point, but there are exchanges happening with the ocean as well. Um, and then you get some yeah, net sink regions like South America um, that pop up. Um, so that's the average over six years, but we can also zoom in on a single grid cell, um, one location sort of up near Seattle picks simply because it's in the top left of the map, so I could fit this other plot in here. <laughs> um, and if you zoom in on this, we can see what's happening over time within that, lo at that location. Um, so the plot at the, the top shows um, fluxes in each month in this grid cell due to either natural processes, that's in green, uh, or to fossil fuel usage, that's in um, black. Uh, so you can see there's this huge cycle up and down, up and down in the green plot. Uh, that's, that's the seasonal cycle, and, and it's very pronounced in this region because this region is um, pretty northerly, so it's subject to large temperature changes throughout the year. Um, so really that's autumn and, um, sorry, that's uh, winter and summer showing up there. So what happens is that in, um, in, in spring, plants grow and they suck carbon down. Um, so that's when this goes negative. And then in, in autumn or fall, as they would call it in that region of the world, um, that's when the, the decay happens and the, the release of the carbon happens again. Um, interestingly, the fossil fuel fluxes don't vary that much through the year. I mean, you'd think you'd use a little bit more during the winter, and that's probably true, uh, but you can't see it against how huge the variation is in the natural fluxes. Um, so the plot below shows what happens in the average within each year. Um, and now it's interesting because now the fossil fuel flux is, is actually about the same sort of magnitude scale as the, the ecosystem, the, the natural fluxes. So because, of course, the natural fluxes switch from positive to negative, so it can average out to something relatively small. Um, now talking about the, the green line at the top, the, the natural fluxes, um, changes to that are the sort of thing we're interested in in this study. How, how natural fluxes can be changing, how the cycles can change. Um, and, and essentially, we want to look for trends in, in, these, in these things. Um, and not just at this location, but you know, everywhere. Um, so as we talked about earlier, CO2 um, hits the atmosphere and then, and then it moves around. Uh, and, and here's a snapshot of, of the atmospheric concentration. So this is no longer what's happening at the surface. This is in the atmosphere, um, showing the average CO2 concentration at each location. Um, and, and these aren't um, estimates, they're just sort of plausible values that give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, you can see there's some hot spots with high CO2 concentrations over China, that's probably due to fossil fuel emissions over China and so on. Um, so we call this object Y, um, and it varies with space height and time, so it's also vertical. Um, and it's very dynamic, although you can't see the dynamics in this picture. Um, and, 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 and as I just said, you know, although this picture is 2D, CO2 does actually move vertically as well, so it's hard to visualize. Um, and now I've got a video which I'll play. So, so um, 
this shows a few things. It, it shows the flux field X, that's on the left, um, and it shows how it drives concentrations on the Y, and you'll get a bit of a feel for how CO2 moves around. Um, so what will happen here is, is once I play the animation, there are going to be some fluxes in North America, in the top left, um, mostly emissions, uh, and they're going to run for a month and then stop. And then on the right, you're going to see the impact this has on atmospheric concentration. So it's going to cause a change. So I'll, I'll play it. Uh, so, so initially, you see the concentrations as the fluxes are happening. They, they, um, um, they're concentrated. Um, the, 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 concent the changes to the concentration uh, are high over North America, where the emissions are happening. Um, but once the emissions stop, you see that the CO2 starts to spread out. And this is only a couple of weeks, and it spreads out over the whole hemisphere. And there are some neat patterns here. You can see sort of like rolling, you know, um, swelling things and so on. Um, eventually, actually, this mixes completely all the way down to the South Pole, but it takes several years to do that. So that's kind of how um, fluxes, which is what's happening at the surface, can be related to what's happening up in the atmosphere, which is going to be very important for our hunt. Uh, and speaking of the hunt, this is the hunt for changes to the carbon cycle. So I can talk about that now. I've, I've got enough background in. Um, so I'll talk, let's talk about that. So talking a lot about CO2 fluxes, and the, one of the key features of CO2 fluxes is that they're very hard to measure directly, uh, at least natural ones are. And that's because they occur over really large scales. Um, and they also, uh, the measurement techniques that do exist for that can be really subject to local conditions, like local winds or local topography and stuff like that. So although you could get a pretty good estimate for one location, it's not clear that that would be representative of a broad ecosystem. Um, but when you're trying to understand the carbon cycle as a whole, you need to understand broad ecosystems, not just specific locations. Um, now, for human emissions, on the other hand, there are quite good proxies that can tell you things about where the emissions are happening. So we know where people are, where they live, so we know where their cars are, we know pretty much where the factories are, we know how much electricity people use because governments collect that information. So there are good proxies that can tell you a lot about emissions. Um, but for the natural fluxes, the proxies are much more limited and, and they have um, weaknesses that, that are difficult to overcome. Um, however, by contrast, the, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, which we saw the picture of before, uh, that is easy, relatively um, easy to observe. Uh, and, and so that's what we're going to use here. We're going to start with CO2 concentrations and work backwards to CO2 fluxes. So we'll get to that. But first I'll talk more about um, the data that we have on CO2 concentrations, if we're going to use them. Um, so measurements of CO2 and, and other gases for that matter have been made for decades um, by um, different scientific agencies and different scientists. Um, and among those uh, are um, CSIRO here in Australia and, and NOAA, who I, uh, which I mentioned before in the US. Um, and here are three example stations. This is what these direct measurement stations look like. So there's um, Barrow Observatory in the top left, and as you can guess, that's somewhere cold. That's the very northern end of Alaska, um, so about as far north as you can get in North America. <clears throat> um, there's a famous um, Mauna Loa Observatory in the bottom left. That's on a mountain in Hawaii. Um, that's where I showed the plot of, emission of um, CO2 concentrations from very early on. Um, and, and if you squint at, at the cape shown in the bottom right, you can see a station sitting on that cape, that's Cape Grim in the very northwest end of Tasmania. So these are all sites that have been collecting CO2 um, and other gases for a long time. Um, and, and here's what the data looked like um, over six years in uh, Cape Grim. I just picked Cape Grim because we're in Australia. Um, on the left part there. Uh, so you can see the main feature is this steady increase in the CO2 concentration, something we already know about. Um, but there are some spikes as well. When some event moves over, I'm not sure exactly what that event would be. Um, and actually, there's, if you look closely, there's a seasonal cycle going on here too. So it goes up and down and down with the seasons. And again, that's, in, um, that's, the, that's the summer winter cycle. Um, and on the right, I've shown a map of all the locations that we end up using in our study, um, <clears throat> all the measurement sites. Uh, so the red dots are the measurement sites. And, and, and you can see that although there are some in the Southern Hemisphere, they're really clustered in North America and Europe. And, and actually, you could probably use this plot as a proxy for like wealth of a nation, <laughs> actually, right? Um, and, and, and what that means is that the, the global south, as it's often called, and, and the tropics are, are really pretty poorly observed. Um, you know, there's not, I mean, there's not a single station in India, for example, um, um, and large, there's stations at the north of Africa and at the south of Africa, but nothing in the middle. 
So there's huge areas of the world that are really poorly observed by this network, so that they have some limitations. Um, and scientists were concerned about this limitation, these limitations, and, and NASA was concerned about it. So in 2014, they launched a satellite um, called the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 2, or OCO2. So they're very clever. They managed to hide CO2 in the acronym. Um, well, it's almost an accident, but I won't tell that story. Um, so it's a clever name. Um, and since that time, since 2014, this satellite uh, has been in orbit, um, pretty much continuously collecting um, observations of the amount of CO2 uh, below it. Um, <clears throat> so how that works is, is actually um, very, very interesting. Um, and I don't have, um, really have time to go into it. I'm actually not an expert in it. Um, and maybe even some of the real experts are, are here or listening in, so they would um, correct me, but, but I'll, give a, a, I'll, I'll give you a rough idea. So um, essentially the satellite looks down uh, and looks at um, the sunlight being reflected off the surface. Um, and what, what's something to know about CO2 is that when light goes through it, uh, CO2 absorbs certain wavelengths of light, um, including very importantly in the infrared band. Um, and what you can do is you know what the sunlight would have looked like before it went through that air. Uh, so seeing what's lost from it in the CO2 absorption bands can give you a sense of how much CO2 it went through. Like that's essentially right. It's actually pretty complicated. Um, so that's how that works. Uh, and, and it gives you some idea of what's underneath you. Um, and and here, are some, here are some data again, um, but this time for the satellite. Uh, so on the left is a, a one week of observations from the satellite. Um, and, and immediately you can see the spatial coverage, even in this week, is, is quite different to the spatial coverage, like the locations of those measurement sites that we had before. Um, you can also see kind of lights on this plot. Um, that's the orbital track of the satellite. So the satellites, if this is the globe, the satellite's orbiting in a, in a um, near pole, uh, well, a polar orbit, you'd call it, um, which gives it pretty good coverage over the, over the planet. Um, um, and, and yes, yeah, so you can actually just see that. Um, you can see what its orbit is directly from the plot. Um, now on the right, I've shown a, a density map of where the observations, or how many observations were taken in each location over, over six years. Um, so, so it's not quite uniform over the globe. There are spots that are harder or easier to observe, um, but it's much more uniform than the um, measurements that we saw before, the measurement stations that we, we saw before, which is really the whole point of putting this satellite up in the first place. So there's at least coverage in every grid square, basically, yeah. Um, I will also say the satellite also collects data over the ocean, um, but we didn't end up using it because there were um, concerns about its quality, essentially. I won't speak more of that. Um, but, and then you can contrast the pros and cons of these different methods um, for observing CO2. So, so direct methods um, have the advantage that they're precise and unbiased because they actually sample the air that's exactly right there. You know, they often, um, one of the older techniques that's still in use is actually just to go and actually suck some air into a gas canister, then take it to a laboratory and analyze it. So you can imagine you can get that pretty accurately. Um, whereas the satellite observations are less precise, which, which is fair enough because you know, you're looking from 100, like 100 kilometers plus down in space <laughs> back down at the Earth. Um, and they might have some bias too, that's important. Um, now then a con for the direct methods, so that would have been a pro for the direct methods. A con for the direct methods is what we already talked about. They're only taken at some locations. Um, Whereas um, the satellite over time covers the whole globe, more or less. Uh, so that's a pro for the satellite. Um, and then back in an advantage for the direct measurements, the direct measurements have, um, at the locations you do take the measurements, they actually have really good coverage over time so that they can collect measurements all day, all night, um, all seasons, and so on. Um, whereas by contrast, the satellite only sees the same location every few weeks because its orbit doesn't align over that spot, again, until a few weeks. Um, and also the satellite only observes around midday, because that's when you get the sunlight on the wind. Um, if it's dark, you can't see any, you can't, you can't look through sunlight if it's dark. So makes sense. Um, so pretty clearly, um, when you lay it out like this, these two data sources are, are complementary. Um, there's, not, there's not one that's better than the other. Um, and so in, in this work, we, we make efforts to use um, both of them. Um, okay, so, so our goal is to understand the fluxes, um, and to get those, we're going to go backwards from CO2 concentrations, like I said. Um, and, and that process of going backwards has a cool name. It's called um, flux inversion. 
Um, and, and the idea is based on the video earlier, you know, where we had emissions from a location, they spread out. And the way they spread out, um, and, I, and I've shown um, just some still shots from that same video, the way they spread out actually has a signature that's particular to that location. Um, <clears throat> a distinct pattern over space and time, distinct to that location. And, and so what you can do is, is by looking at the patterns of the CO2 that you observe in the atmosphere, you know, where the hotspots are, what time those hotspots occur, you, you can trace it back to get an estimate of, of where the CO2 came from. Um, now, that's not, that doesn't just work for emission, because if you have, um, if you have a, an absorption of CO2 by an ecosystem, the, um, all things equal, the CO2 will be lower than we would have expected. So that, can still, that too can tell you about what's going on. Um, now, of course, you can never do this perfectly because you can imagine that if you have two locations, you know, even 50 kilometres apart, their signature, the pattern, looks pretty similar. Um, so immediately there's uncertainties in this, um, and formally we call this an ill posed problem. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't get some estimates. Uh, and we're not the only group by far that has looked at this problem. Um, so this, uh, if you build a system to do this, it's, it's called a flux inversion system, makes sense. Um, and actually there are quite a few around for these, for CO2. Um, so we're not by any means the only game in town. Um, and some systems in fact are, are well-funded and operate um, and update their estimates regularly. So they don't just do one shot, they, they every year do a new release or something like that. Um, including some that I've named here, Carbon Tracker by NOAA, um, the Carbon Monitoring System by NASA, um, and there's um, one is, um, out of the EU called the Copernicus Atmospheric Monitoring Service. Um, so these systems all um, uh, are flux inversion systems that are attempting to answer similar questions to us. Um, and, and we here at Wollongong built one, uh, uh, which we called the, um, the Wollongong Methodology for Bayesian Assimilation of Trace Gases. Um, and uh, I, I perhaps should have put a hyphen in the trace gases because we turned that into an acronym, which is WOMAP. Um, so hopefully, you know, you can walk away here. If you take nothing else away, you can you can appreciate how we can torture the English language to produce the acronym that we're looking for. Um, but you know, wombat it rolls off the tongue. So actually, we're up to version two of the wombat flux inversion system. Um, and you know, I guess we're all in Australia. We know what wombats look like, but it doesn't hurt to look at them and lower the blood pressure. I think, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, especially this sort of Tasmanian wombat. Um, so the first version of Wombat, so two versions of Wombat. The first version of Wombat introduced innovations from stati statistics. So remember, I'm a statistician. There are several statisticians on this um, to try to improve what's called uncertainty quantification of CO2 fluxes. Um, so uncertainty is really, really important for flux because like we said, um, there's no unique solution to the problem. You always have a range of solutions. And that's, that's even if you had perfect measurements, which, which one doesn't have perfect measurements. So once you have uncertainty from your measurements too. So remember the satellite isn't all that precise. Um, um, you also need to take a very careful account of uncertainty as well. Uh, recently, um, so, so Wombat version one went out and it got some interest from um, um, traditional, um, the traditional carbon flux inversion community because it had some innovations. Uh, and then we set to work making version two. Um, and the idea in version two is to build on version one, retain the features of version one, uh, and then to tailor it to, directly to study um, changes in the carbon cycle, this, this really important notion of um, what's changing and how fast. Um, so I'm a statistician, uh, and this is a joint seminar from a maths and stats school. Um, so I really had to put this slide up. Um, this is just about the only mathematics in the whole talk, um, and I'm not going to go through it in detail. Um, I'm just I'm almost ticking the box here. Um, but essentially, for, for those interested, uh, we have a hierarchical Bayesian model. Um, data is at the top. It flows through that concentration field, or it's also called the mole fraction field. And then that's driven by the, the flux field, that's X. So you can see Y and X are here, those are symbols we talked about. Um, we also use some special um, decomposition to better understand the fluxes. Uh, we have physical constraints on some fields and, and so on. Um, but, you know, this talks about the science, not so much about the math, so I'll move on from this slide, but I've shown it. Um, um, okay, so, yeah, I can talk about our findings and then I'll, then I'll be done. So, um, a, a few details. So, so we, looked at, we looked at fluxes over 2015 to 2020, and the reason why it's that time period is 
um, at least when we started this work last year, that was the period that OCO2 had been operating, the satellite had been operating. Of course, we also had data from the um, direct measurements that outside of that period that we wanted to use both data sources. Um, our work accounts for CO2 emissions from fossil fuels and um, fires and, and a few other sources, um, but our science focuses on natural fluxes, um, which include the ocean and um, the ocean and the uh, land ecosystems. Uh, so, so here's a, a first finding, um, and if you're an atmospheric scientist or a carbon scientist person, it's, not, it's, it's sort of not a surprising finding. Um, and and that's, that's that, as we know, that the land and the ocean are absorbing our CO2 emissions. So we have um, an estimate of the trend of um, ocean fluxes at the top and the trend in land fluxes at the bottom. And if you look at the scale on the left, it's negative, which means it's, it's drawing down, it's pulling, it's pulling carbon in, both of them. <clears throat> and the plot shows the um, estimated linear trend. And the other thing you can see about this linear trend is it's negative, which means that the uptake is increasing over time. So the sink is getting deeper, which is good news um, because we're still emitting CO2. Um, so there is expected, actually, these results by previous studies, but it's reassuring to see this because, um, you know, like I said, humanity's emissions continue to increase. So we want to see that these ecosystems are still responding and, and, and increasing their uptake. Um, and while I've got some numbers up here, I'll pause and say, you know, if you've never seen um, figures related to carbon exchange before, um, you, the, the, the scale here is petagrams of carbon per year, petagram. So a petagram is a gigaton. It, it's really an astonishing amount of carbon that's moving between the atmosphere and the surface. Um, and and even, the, um, even the trends, although they seem gradual in relation to this huge exchange that's happening, they're measured in teragrams in, per year. So there's huge changes happening in, in absolute terms, huge changes. Um, so on net, that's the net, um, land ecosystems are increasing their uptake, and it's, it's, it's worth asking um, where that's happening. Uh, so, so that's what this plot shows. Um, this is a plot of the trend that we estimate at every location in the land flux, uh, the land ecosystem flux. Uh, and what it turns out is our method says that this is happening primarily in the, in the tropics. Um, and that's because you, you see this blue, that's negative, that means that the trend is down, which means that more going in. Um, the tropics are often called the, the lungs of the world, um, and what this would suggest is that that's, um, that's becoming more true over time. They're, absor they're, they're um, um, absorbing more carbon. Um, but outside of the tropics, in fact, many ecosystems are, are decreasing their uptake, which, which is concerning. So um, the one that jumps out most is, is in North America, where it looks like there's um, um, uh, increasing flux of so more emission from ecosystems too. This isn't fossil fuels, this is that stuff to check it out. Um, we're working, that's, that's a little bit of a surprise, so we're working on understanding why that is. Um, if we just zoom in on the tropics a little bit more, um, something interesting actually happens over this time period, um, which is, yes, yeah, so we, we, we already observed that the tropics are increasing how much CO2 they take in. But actually, they transition um, over the time period. We look at them from being a source to a sink in net terms uh, around 2018. So this line, if you look at the scale on the left, it starts positive and goes negative. So what's interesting is that um, tropical ecosystems at the start of our time period are net emitting CO2, but by the end, they're absorbing CO2. Um, and the rate of change at which this is happening is, is steeper than the overall global trend, which actually has to be the case. But, um, um, yeah, so this is really interesting and also something that surprised our collaborators, so we're looking into why this is. Um, but there are lots of hypotheses we can come up with, um, um, and one of the main ones would just be that CO2 fertilisation effect, whereas as the CO2 concentration increases, eco, um, it's easier for plants to grow. Um, so, so that was about trends, but there are other ways that, that um, the cycles of CO2 can change. Um, so as we saw in the example earlier, uh, for like in the northwest of the US, there are actually seasonal cycles in the fluxes that the summer, winter, summer, winter, the plants um, in, in spring grow and in autumn lose their leaves. Um, um, of course, the seasonal cycles are opposite in the northern hemisphere and the, and the southern hemisphere, um, but uh, it turns out that the northern hemisphere really dominates the global seasonality, and that's because the land area is so huge and it's got these enormous forests. Um, and so on. Um, 
And, uh, and, and what that means is that on net over the whole globe, at some times the land ecosystem is a source and at other times it's a sink. Now we know that on net it's a sink, but at, at a particular time of the year that might not be true. But, so this is a plot that, that kind of shows that. Um, this is the global seasonal cycle from January through December, and then I show what the seasonal cycle looked like in 2015 through to 2020. Each year is a separate line. Um, so what you can actually see here is this is changing. Uh, it may look small, but um, this is only six years, so the fact that you can discern this by eye is even <laughs> interesting. Um, so it looks like the um, seasonal cycle um, is the amplitude is getting bigger. So the, the difference between the peak and the trough is getting bigger. And we can, our method actually gives us an estimate of that, and we estimate that that's growing by 18 teragrams of carbon per month per year. So the per month is just the, the units of the seasonal cycle. Um, and, and in fact, that, that change is, you know, actually that number is three times faster, three, three times faster than the, the trend was changing. So it's a, it's a big change. Um, so th this has um, been um, expected to, it's or observed by other people too, although there's still hypotheses about why. Um, and again, it's worth asking the question about where is this happening? So this is a plot of the trend that we estimate at every, um, at every location. Uh, sorry, not the trend, sorry, the amplitude change um, in the seasonal cycle. So how much the amplitude, um, the peak to trough of the seasonal cycle has changed um, over the six years. Um, and um, um, we actually find that there are changes everywhere uh, and mostly towards increasing amplitude. Uh, but in the end, it's dominated by the northern ecosystems because they're so big um, and very seasonal. Um, so those northern ecosystems are changing a lot, uh, and there are some existing hypotheses in the literature as to why that might be. Um, some of it, um, because of warming temperatures, different type of plants are moving further north um, and changing the composition of those ecosystems. That's a, that's a possibility. Um, another thing is that they're trees that actually die, but then they regrow. And so you have younger trees, and I don't actually know the reason why, but evidently younger trees um, um, exchange more carbon, they cycle more. Um, <clears throat> that, so that could apparently cause this too. Um, we're hoping our results and this sort of spatial distribution of the results will shed some more light on this. We're talking to the main experts about it. Um, and, and the last finding I'll talk about, so, um, We've got the seasonal cycle, and, and uh, remember earlier on I talked about other papers talking about the idea of growing seasons shifting, moving earlier or later. Um, that, that uh, particularly in the northern regions, um, for us that will show up in the seasonal cycle of the, of the land fluxes moving earlier or later as well, because if the plants are starting to grow earlier, that means they'll be drawing CO2 down earlier. Um, <clears throat> So that, unfortunately, though, the shifts are small, like they're over six years, we're talking about a day. Now, that, that, that's actually not that small. You, you think six years a day, but that's actually like a month over a century, <laughs> but, um, which is actually pretty fast for a climate, uh, carbon cycle to be changing. But they're small enough that you can't see the difference in um, you know, that plot. You can't see a day. Um, but what we can do instead is draw a map of, of, of what the, um, the shift is at every, every location that we estimate. And I've actually grayed out the tropics here because the tropics are a mess in the sense that um, um, it's very um, hard for us to estimate what's going there and it's a bit distracting visually. So, um, but we do think we have good estimates in the northern ecosystems, particularly um, uh, in the temperate and the boreal regions. Um, and we find that on net, um, the uh, northern hemisphere, the northern ecosystems are shifting their fluxes earlier in the year. The cycle is shifting earlier, um, um, which, which matches previous work, but it, uh, we've got an additional finding, which is that spatially that's not homogenous, which is like in, in, in um, Northeast Asia, it, it's, it's that, that's the case. Things are, things are shifting earlier. Uh, so red is earlier, by the way. Um, but in um, northern, the northern uh, um, end of North America, it looks like they're shifting later, which is quite unexpected when we showed these results to our um, collaborators in, in, in the um, atmospheric sciences, so we're, we're looking at this with, with great interest um, because when you get something that you don't expect, that's of interest. Um, yeah, so that's the last one. And I think with that, I can wrap up. So I'll summarize quickly. Um, the carbon cycle is changing uh, and, and mostly in response to human influences of, of various sorts. Um, importantly, um, the tropics are increasing their uptake of CO2, which is good, um, but we need to understand why and we need to know whether that will continue because it really matters for future climate change. Um, and I suppose I'll just end, you know, a bit selfishly making a plug for our role as statisticians um, and say that we hope that this work is um, 
some evidence that, that when you confuse statistical techniques with techniques from other fields, in this case, um, atmospheric sciences, then, then that can help you answer important questions. Um, so yeah, that's all I have. So thank you very much.